and we are now recording. Great, thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> and welcome everybody to the um, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 2023, uh, <laughs> uh, meeting of the uh, uh, Solar Bylaw Working Group for Amherst. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, so today we're going to flip things a little bit around with um, uh, going through some initial um, items that we uh, are sort of quick quick item ag uh, agenda items, but then um, move to the um, assuming Chris is able to join us, uh, move to um, an update from her, um, as was discussed, and you know my hats off to Christine for the hard work that she's doing. Um, that um, we we don't have any new language to look at today, but I think importantly we do have uh, sort of what we would call a second review or second reading of the design standards uh, with her edits based on their first review um, at their last meeting, as well as a, a set of uh, interesting and I think helpful issues that she's bulleted uh, for us to um, uh that are at least amongst the issues that we will want to discuss and we can look at that list and see if uh time permitting um uh, engage in some discussion on those issues i think some of them might be better off uh waiting for um our meet uh, our subsequent um agenda item uh which is a discussion with uh dave zomack uh um particularly around farmland, uh, but also I think a little bit more generally about land use and conservation land in the town um, of Amherst. Uh, and then we'll um, we'll close out um, with uh, agenda items and public comment. Um, so uh, but before we get going, um, uh, with uh, uh, apologies for uh, messing up your St. Patrick's Day, Janet, but I think you're on on uh, the books for minutes this time. No, I'm I'm emotionally prepared. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Hey, I I object. I think she's getting an easy meeting compared to the one I had last week. So <laughs> <laughs> my celebration okay. is tomorrow anyway. So okay. <laughs> okay, and um, and uh, so we we um we don't have uh, minutes from last week that uh, Jack provided. Um, those aren't prepared yet for uh, us to review. Um, so we can skip over that agenda item, but um, ideally, if we can, we'll have two sets of minutes next time to, to review and, and approve. Uh, but thank you, Janet, um, for taking notes today and, and Jack for the notes from, from uh, last uh, meeting. Yeah, they're drafted there, but, but as of yesterday, so they need some processing. So. Okay. Yep. No. No worries at all. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, I guess we can move forward to um, staff updates, uh, which I think is you, Stephanie. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I, I know Chris is here, and she'll be joining us okay. momentarily. Okay. Um, so, uh, a few things. First, I just wanted to say that we did have our um, public presentation through Zoom around the solar assessment on Monday. Uh, we had 21 participants. Um, it is recorded and posted. I think it's actually with the ECAC education series recordings was the easiest place for IT to sort of plant that recording. So it is available. Um, we've had the other day, when the when we actually had that presentation on Monday, we had 129 responses to the uh, solar survey so far. Then um, on Wednesday before the ECAC meeting, we had 241, and as of today, we have 287. Hmm. So we're really getting some great responses, um, you know, which is great. Um, the postcards went out, so I know that people received them in their homes. 10,000 postcards went out to households in the town. So um, quite a robust effort to sort of get the word out. So we'll be collecting the data. And then um, uh, tomorrow, Saturday, we will be having that first workshop with um, with the community from 12 to 2 in the Woodbury Room of the Jones Library. And then 
Thursday, the 23rd, we'll have another one from 6 to 8 p.m., also in the Woodbury Room of the Jones Library. And those are going to be very family-friendly, interactive. People can just drop in. Uh, they don't have to stay the whole time. Um, there'll be stations where people can engage on sort of their views on solar. There'll be some snacks and activities for kids. So it'll be really a fun, engaging space. And people can leave their comments anonymously. So it's a safe place for people if they don't want to have to engage. Um, around their viewpoints, they can certainly do so anonymously. Um, and then I do want to say, uh, relevant to this meeting and really all public meetings in town, so the Massachusetts legislature, um, both the House and the Senate voted to extend the remote meeting option um, for two years till uh, March 31st of 2025. However, they have different language and so that has to be reconciled before it can actually go into effect. So um, as of right now, until we get the official word, um, potentially remote meetings will cease on March 31st. So that means our April 14th meeting might potentially have to be live if the legislature doesn't sort of come together and reconcile the language and we get the official word that we can stay remote. Um, until March 31st of 2025. So I just wanted to give you that heads up because I know the ECAC the other night, I have to report back to them as well because um, someone was under the impression that they had actually passed it, but it really hasn't officially gone into effect. So um, just letting you know, and we can check in about that um, regarding a quorum. It just means that, um, it just means that some folks can participate remotely but it can't be a we have to have a quorum in person. The chair has to be in person, and um, you have to actually request to be remote, and the chair has to authorize you to be able to do so. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. Good. Okay. So um, Janet has a question. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, does that mean that you have to be, we have to hold Zooms or just that we have the option to Zoom? Like if, um, if the legislation passes. If the legislation passes, we'll be continuing through Zoom. I think that's, I mean, there there may be, because we don't, as of right now, we don't really have the setups to accommodate all of our boards and committees being um, in a sort of hybrid situation. So we're just going to be continuing remotely. We get more um, we get more committee participation and we get more public participation when we're remote. Okay. Yeah, great. All right. Um, okay, so uh, but we're we're um in any, any case we're good for our, our next meeting, which is on the last day of of, of the right. existing law. Um, and uh, maybe we'll have an update at that point, or maybe not. <laughs> but hopefully. We'll okay, yeah, great. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Anything else? Nope. I think that's good for now. Great. Okay. Anything from you, Chris? I, I know you're you're next on the agenda on, on the uh, on the um, by oh. itself, but any uh, other in announcements of usefulness? I think maybe the most useful thing I can say is that we are hiring um, a planner, and he's going to be starting on March 29th. Oh, excellent. So that is really good news because it's going to mean that we're able to. Um, not be sort of as overwhelmed as we've yeah. been. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent news to hear, mm -hmm. Chris. Thank you. Okay. Anything else before we go on to uh, committee updates from any of us that liaise with any of the committees? Um, I'll start with uh, ECAC, uh, only to say, um, and overlaps uh, uh, also very much with uh, Stephanie as the, uh, I think, coordinator of the Sustainability Festival on uh, Amherst Town Commons on Earth Day, April 22nd. Um, ECAC is gonna have a table um, there with some uh, information to um, uh, distribute or at least um, have access to. We don't wanna have a whole lot of paper there, but we'll have uh, some useful information um and um uh just wanted to alert everybody to that um uh, april 22nd it's a saturday on the commons um it's always a good good place to uh, mingle and and learn learn about uh, what's going on around town 
We have some great entertainment lined up too. Oh, well, <laughs> nice. Okay, great. Yep, added bonus. Okay, anybody else from yeah. uh, from a uh, committee, uh, other committees that we're on? I don't really have anything. All right, great. Okay, so um, again, with um, Dave Zomack, assuming he can skip, stick to his schedule, uh, is expected to show up around 1230. So we'll sort of um, uh, work with him uh, in sort of a Q&A format, I believe, um, uh, for the second half of the meeting. Um, leaving enough time for public comment and, and some discussion about agenda for the next meeting or next set of meetings. Uh, but let's move forward to um, uh, Chris um, and um, however you'd like to, to work this and no worries whatsoever about uh, emailing us last night as well as um, not having additional um, draft together. Um, it looks like you've done done some really good work on revisions to the uh, design standards, um, as well as um, really thinking through some other issues. Uh, and I mentioned, I think, before you got on that we can also take a look at those to uh, discuss some of those or at least um, um, highlight uh, some of those that we want to uh, specifically discuss in coming meetings. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to. Um say that I, I wished that I could have come up with a, a new section, but I wasn't able to, but I did go back and review the design standards that we talked about on March 3rd, and I have incorporated um, the changes and comments that were made. So if we want to go over those, that would be helpful. And then we can um, shift to that list of items that I put in my email last night. And those are things that I've been kind of mentally wrestling with. Um, and I think they um, touch on some of the issues that the rest of you have been thinking about and, you know, wondering how are we going to are we going to address some of these issues and if so, how? So in any event, let's start with the um, design standards and um, thank you, Stephanie, for putting it up on the screen. So um, we talked about access roads and access roads shall be planned and constructed in consultation with the town engineer and the Department of Public Works and shall be planned and constructed to minimize grading, stormwater runoff, removal of stone walls and trees, and to minimize impacts to natural and cultural resources. At the discretion of the permit granting authority, roads should be curved to the extent possible to limit direct views into the project, especially from scenic roads and to slow down stormwater runoff so as to limit or prevent erosion. This last phrase was something that Stephanie um, suggested adding, and I think it's a good idea because that is one of the reasons why you, you might want to have a curved road, but as opposed to a straight road. Mm -hmm. So are there any comments on that section? Okay. I can't see all of you, but um, I'll just go go on unless I hear from somebody. Um, lighting. Um, lighting of large scale, and, and I did try to make the language um, coordinated, so I'm referring to either large scale ground mounted solar volta voltaic installations, or sometimes I just put these installations. So in any event, this is the first instance of that. Lighting of large scale ground mounted solar pho photovoltaic installations shall be consistent with local, state, and federal law. Lighting of other parts of the installation, such as appurtenant structures, shall be limited to that required for safety and operational purposes, and shall be reasonably shielded from abutting properties. Where feasible, lighting of these installations shall be directed downward and shall incorporate full cutoff fixtures to reduce light pollution. Lighting of these installations shall be limited to nighttime maintenance and inspections by authorized personnel. Lighting controls shall be available for emergency personnel to turn on at their discretion during an emergency. I think that was something Laura might have brought up. All lighting shall comply with international dark sky standards, fixture seal of approval, certification requirements. There should be no illumination when personnel are not on the site. Are there any comments there? Looks like yeah, Janet. Yep, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, I, I wondered just about the language, like where feasible lighting of these installations shall be directed downward. 
it, and I, I, the reason I thought about it, I couldn't imagine a situation where you'd be guiding the sky, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, we mm-hmm. sort of have a general rule, like everything's downward. Mm-hmm. I just, I just, you know, I, it's not a huge point, but I just wondered, yeah, is there some point where you really need to like, you know, be pointing upward or I don't know. Yeah. I might say shall be downward face downward pointing unless not feasible. Put it just, the other way. Yeah. But Laura may have some uh, insights on this as well. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, my only comment was um, we don't have any FAA regulated land at Amherst, do we? Not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah. So yeah. I would just say um, the only times I've seen very particular requirements for lighting is when there's FAA requirements or if it's um, near, you know, I would just say uh, when possible, you know, unless otherwise, you know, um, you know, unless otherwise wanna, approved by the permit granting. Yeah, area. exactly. Like there might be another larger requirement that we just want to, um, you know, we might have to bow to. That's all. Okay. All right, um, signage, signs on large scale ground mounted sol- solar photovoltaic installations shall comply with the Town of Amherst Zoning Bylaw Article 8. A sign consistent with Town of Amherst Zoning Bylaw Article 8 shall be required to identify the owner and provide a 24 hour emergency contact phone number of the installation owner or operator. Large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations shall not be used for displaying any advertising except for reasonable identification of the manufacturer or operator of the solar photovoltaic installation. I feel like I'm speaking a different language when I say that. (laughs) In addition to identification signs, the permit granting authority shall permit signs for safety, such as no trespassing signs and signs required to warn of danger. Emergency signage for battery energy storage facilities associated with large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, including signs for emergency shutoff procedures and signs related to fire management and fire suppression shall be required. At the discretion of the permit granting authority, exceptions may also be made for educational signs that provide information about the project. The permit granting authority shall determine the appropriate size, materials, and placement of such educational signs. To the extent possible, signs should be grouped together to reduce sign clutter. So those were were the things Um, that we- Yeah, awesome. Uh, Okay, Laura, you, you, I guess that your hand was up from before. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I wanted to make sure it included, I mean, the educational signage I thought might be cool if we ever had a need. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say just as an example, we have a, um, if a project does get certified for pollinator friendly, um, we give them a little sign <laughs> uh, to, to hang up there. I don't think, I think it would be under this educational mm-hmm. um, category. Mm-hmm. Okay, so is that section yeah. all right? The uh, Janet, section. Yeah. Um, I think you need a comma after the words fire suppression. Fire suppression. That's it. Related to fire management and fire suppression. Uh-huh. Inclu- okay, yeah, yeah. I see. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. So just one other quick thing. I just returned from um, a conference in Phoenix where a lot of the largest battery storage experts attended. These are groups that are basically cutting edge and doing their own internal research, very large companies. Um, And the general consensus is, you know, you don't touch a battery if there's ever a fire. You just, you you let it burn and within, you know, like one to two days, it'll put itself out. So for what it's worth, that's that's the consensus. I don't think it adjusts the language at all, but I just wanted to share that with the group. So you think this language is okay the way it is, but the I do. practice I mean, even, would be not yeah, to even touch it. Even if it's like you open up the box and it's like, don't touch the battery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on. Um, there were questions about this utility section, utility connections. So we put in the words where feasible 
reasonable efforts as determined by the current permit granting authority shall be made to place all utility connections from the solar photovoltaic installation underground depending on appropriate soil conditions, shape, and topography of the site, and any requirements of the utility provider. Electrical transformers for utility interconnections may be above ground if required by the utility provider. Um, so there were uh, concerns about the cost of placing these things underground. Um, and Duane had some um, concerns about, you know, would this preclude some of the wires from being overground and that's why we said we're feasible so does anyone have any problem with this language no okay I, let me just ask and laura may have some insights here too uh and maybe it's more like what you, uh, there's a lot riding on the PGA on this uh, in terms of uh, as as determined by the PGA if if um, uh, if uh, he or she uh, thinks it's feasible. Yeah, and um, I think it, the feasibility is going to come in the form of economic feasibility. Yeah, I'm wondering if it should say something about we're technically and economically feasible. I, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Technically and economically. Right. And, yep. and then, Laura, do you, have you, I don't know too much about exactly what the um, electrical transformer is, but I, I don't suspect that's really ever underground. <laughs> no. no, um, no, no. So I'm not no. sure if we need that, uh, or it's just as, assumed that it's um, obviously, you know, wires potentially can go underground, but a transformer you really doesn't, isn't applicable to be put underground. What if we left off the first three words and just said utility interconnections may be above ground if required by the utility provider? Because the provider would be like Eversource or somebody, right? It wouldn't be the install installer or the owner of the facility. It would be whoever's receiving the um, electricity, right? Well, are who owns the transformer? Is that the utility company? Depends on how you're interconnected. Um, so, but I don't think, I think we wanna remain um, a little bit ambiguous here because it's not necessarily always prescribed. Mm -hmm. So if we said utility interconnections may be above ground if required by the utility provider, would that be appropriate? Because um, the CBA can't override what the utility provider needs, I would assume. Yeah. yeah. Or do you think we should just leave this sentence out? Um, um, will you send, can you, can I, I think I want to take that one back if that's okay, Chris. I want to, I want to, um, think on that one. So you'll think about this and get back to us. I'm going to do a little bit of research. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, Martha. Uh, yeah. I mean, my reaction is that the, you utility provider ever source or whoever might might start out with a particular position that they feel is minimizes their cost but there would be room to negotiate with the permit granting authority and so on so i my sense would be to leave that out uh, because the utility provider might set a whole set of requirements i think yeah. we want to be flexible yes. to have the yeah. From granting authority uh, be able to yeah, negotiate. Does that make sense? So in other words, leave out that whole sentence starting with electrical transformers and ending with utility provider. That would be my... Yep. Sort of redundant anyway, isn't it? All right. Okay. Glare. Um, can I... Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, Janet. I, I actually... I'm a little, I'm wondering if we should, um, I actually feel like I need more information about what's usually done 
and is it usually overhead you know if you go underground is it super expensive or you know is that why is that better um because i could see situations where you don't want to put things underground because that might be more disruptive you know all the digging and placement when you're trying to like preserve topsoil uh, you know or it might be more have more impacts environmentally or to whatever so i just kind of feel like i don't know enough to say oh this should be required i wonder if it could just say that the PGA can require that, you know, like give it, give the um, permit granting authority, the authority to require it being underground, depending on circumstance, you know, like the list you put there and things like that. Cause I just don't know enough about what we're talking about um, to say underground is always preferred. And I, Cause I don't even know what the impacts would be in different situations. Sometimes, you know, it seems like it might be easier to just go overhead and be cheaper, it might be better in terms of disturbance um, it might be visually better to have it underground. So I don't know, I, I think maybe give the PGA the the power to sort of decide where it should go, given, you know, information it collects. Well, is that helpful? Um, <laughs> <It's a little> confusing. <laughs> I think that of the uh, installations that I have seen, mm -hmm. the utilities, um, the wires are underground until you get to a point of connection like near a roadway. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, there is, you know, mitigating language where feasible, reasonable efforts okay. as determined by the PGA. So it seems like it yeah. is okay. able to be discussed and whatever turns out to be reasonable is what would be required. And okay. I think if we leave out that last sentence, it kind of you know, leaves it ultimately up to the permit granting authority, but it's saying that the preference is to have the utility connections underground. Okay. All right. Okay. Martha. Yes, yeah, just like clarification, the permit granting authority, that's usually the zoning board of appeals. Is that right? In our town right now, it is the zoning board of appeals. Um, that's another question or discussion that we could have later on about who do we want actually to be the permit granting authority. But right now for all of these facilities, it is the zoning board of appeals. Thank you. Okay, glare. So we had a question last time about the um, concept of coming to the nuisance. In other words, if something is built that is potentially annoying or a nuisance, and then um, someone builds a house next to it, um, does the thing that was there first need to comply with um, requirements that would make it less onerous to the person who came afterwards? And generally speaking, there's this concept of coming to the nuisance that if you move next to a farm or something that makes a lot of noise or is smelly or whatever, that you've taken on that um, burden, that you're not going to put the burden on the person who was there or the facility that was there ahead of time um, to uh, alter their operations in order to please you. So, you know, this is something that we would want to ask KP Law about um, later on, once we've put this whole thing together, they'll be reviewing this anyway. But um, I'm just prefacing this uh, talk about glare with that in mind, because I think Dan asked last time, well, what if somebody ends up building a house next to a solar field? Is the solar field going to have to comply with these anti-glare procedures as a result of that? And I think the answer is no. But um, that's a question that I think could be resolved by talking to KP Law. So anyway, solar panels to the maximum extent feasible shall be positioned and screened so as not to create glare and to minimize glare on surrounding occupied structures. The large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installation shall be positioned to minimize glare on any residence or public way. The applicant should submit ratings and technical specifications for the solar panels to ensure minimum reflectivity. The design of the installation shall prevent reflected solar radiation or glare from becoming a public nuisance or hazard to adjacent buildings, roadways, or properties. Design efforts may include, but not be limited to, deliberate placement and arrangement on the site, anti-reflective materials, solar glare modeling, and screening in addition to required landscaping. 
So do we have anything to say about that section? Dan does. <laughs> yeah, just expanding on my comment. Um, it, it's really more about um, zoning laws regarding airspace. So um, property owners have rights to airspace above their land. So um, if, if you design a solar installation where there's no building on that land, um, but it would create a glare where a building could be constructed, are you violating the neighbor's property rights? Is a little mm -hmm. bit more, That's kind more of specific a... about you know my concern. That might be a, a something for a court to decide. I, I, I don't know if we can resolve that here. I do know of one particular is, instance of this happening where a resident in North Amherst who lives near the facility that's on um, off Sunderland Road um, was bothered by glare in this, in this winter time. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked to the uh, installers and you know they there wasn't anything they could do about it and so she just has to pull her shades down when when the glare becomes a problem she was there long before they were but in that case um that it wasn't a, the issue was not resolvable mm -hmm. okay anything okay. else to say about that yeah yeah is is there any definition of how bright something has to be to call it glare? I mean, what's glare to one person might be inconsequential to another. I mean, do we need any kind of technical definition? <laughs> or... And there's also a time time period. Glare is going to be very time time dependent yeah, as yeah. as the Earth rotates. Yes. Yeah, yeah like right. only certain times of the year and times of the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. sun, sun angle is just right to to actually glare into somebody's window or or, yeah. or space that they they inhabit. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether there's ever been any kind of standard definition, or I'm not aware of any, but we could look into that. Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Visual impact. We talked about this a lot last time, and whether it was reasonable to have these requirements and we said we needed to talk about it more. Um, so one of the issues we talked about was asking KP law whether the town can address issues of visual impact with regard to solar arrays. Um, because, you know, many towns may choose not to have solar arrays because they don't like the way they look. So that's a question that we have to ask. Um, now, one of the uh, things that we may find out during our outreach process is what do people in Amherst think about um, solar arrays and how they look and we may find out more about that and I think maybe Dan mentioned this that um, he thought it would be good to see what people in Amherst think about this issue and then maybe write more uh, into this section or you know leave it alone or whatever mm -hmm. but anyway that it may become clearer to us as time goes on. Um, then we talked about uh, Laura poten potentially figuring out or bringing us information about the minimum requirements that are commonly um, put in place for these installations with regard to visual impact. And are there, you know, kind of generally accepted minimum requirements? Um, or should the uh, and should the permit granting authority have um, discretion based on the view shed where these things are put? So that's uh, that's another question that we have still. Um, and then someone brought up the question of whether some of these analyses are too expensive, um, too detailed, and that they may be burdensome. So those were all things that have yet to be resolved, but we'll go through what the what the wording was that we talked about. Yeah. Before so, you start that, let me just, um, Lauren, Janet, are you, um, does it relate to these questions or are we better off going through the language as we have it so far? My, mine, mine goes to the, the last question, but 
so should I just go? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, when I, I was looking at um, this and I was wondering if we could get money from a, like money figures from another town or like if, if they have this requirement and how it works for them, it may not be really complicated or expensive. And I don't know if there are visual impact consultants, but maybe also talking to them, like, you know, how much, you know, wh what does this entail? Is it expensive? That kind of thing. So I thought, you know, some information from the, the field would be good. All right, Laura. Yeah, and my comment was generally what you see in any kind of solar project are really landscaping and occasionally hardscaping requirements. But, um, you know, I also, I think talking to KP Law is a good idea because, you know, I think we certainly can't make it overly, based on my understanding of sort of how they weighed in, we can't make it overly burdensome or expensive unless there's a you know, detriment to public health and, and welfare. So, um, you know, typically what I've seen actually generally across the board, uh, across the country are landscaping requirements. Um, if uh, in, in certain design, you know, suggestions um, to minimize visual impact um, where there is visual impact, basically, you know, obviously if you're, in, you know, citing a farm in the middle of the desert, you know, it doesn't really apply. But when you're citing a farm, you know, in close proximity to residential or commercial um, establishments, uh, there are landscaping, um, you know, requirements, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's more to be thought about here. Um, so a visual impact assessment shall be conducted that follows established protocols. I don't know if we need to read all of this. Um, we read it through last time, and since we still have the same concerns, maybe we don't need to um, read through all of this. What do you think? I, I would agree. I, I don't think we need to read through it again. Um, no. We'll okay. try to get some more information on this. Yep. All right. Um, so go down to four, visual mitigation. Oh, that's part of the same thing. So let's go, just go to fencing. Mm -hmm. So fencing, um, appropriate measures shall be taken to prevent the solar arrays from being damaged or tampered with by individuals trying to access the area of the installation. I think Laura brought up last time that the owner or the installer or operator would be more interested in pre preventing damage potentially yeah. than the town. So it's yeah. maybe not necessary to say this, but... Um, Maybe it's obvious. Yeah, I mean, the owners are putting, you know, multi, it's a multi million dollar mm -hmm. investment where there's no, you know, owner on site. So, unlike a home, so there's always going to be fencing requirements and things like that. Maybe we put something about um, it is acknowledged that that the owners will be uh, concerned about um, security or something like that, and then say, but the method of securing the site shall be subject to approval of the permit granting authority. So reword the first sentence and leave the second sentence. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Could you say that again, Chris? I missed what you just said. Um, the, the first sentence here is saying, you know, sort of like the town is requiring that these things be fenced. Well, Laura brought up the topic last time that um, the installer and the owner is going to be very interested in having these things fenced so perhaps what we need to say is that we acknowledge that the owner and operator will uh, want to take measures to prevent the solar arrays from being damaged or tampered with but then the second sentence is the most important the method of securing the site shall be subject to approval of okay. the permit granting authority okay does that make sense yeah Okay. Um, the need for fencing shall be determined by the applicant unless such fencing is needed to comply with town bylaws or as required per the National Electric Electrical Code and state regulations. I added and state regulations because I thought the state may have something to say besides the National Electrical Code. Um, if installed, such fencing shall be no more than eight feet tall unless permitted by the permit granting authority. I think the Cape Cod um, regulations have 10 feet, but typically here in Amherst, we've had seven feet. So eight feet seems reasonable here, unless it's, you know, 
permitted by the PGA um, and shall be placed at least six and then maybe say to nine inches off the ground to allow migration of wildlife because there is an instance in Amherst where we did have a requirement that the fence be nine inches off the ground. I think they had larger types of critters moving through there um, and nine inches was considered the correct height. And she'll have an emergency access system padlock or box at each gate. The fence shall be consistent with the character of surrounding properties set back from roadway frontage and public areas and screened by vegetation. I did notice that um, uh, two towns, I looked back over some of the other towns that I've looked at previously, and two towns required black fencing, but black fencing is really expensive because it implies that it's um, vinyl coated. And so I don't think there's a need to do that here, particularly in places where the fence wouldn't be seen. It's possible that we might want to put some requirement like that along the front of a of a solar array if it's going to be um, close to a road. So that's something that we might want to consider. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Janet. Um, I had a I have a question about like I, I don't know in a maybe a question for Laura or anyone who knows more is is are there it, you know, in, in arrays that are very large, could there be issues with like migration or like just or letting wildlife move through? So you like dividing an installation in half so or cutting it up a little bit so the fencing is sort of separated so animals can move through more more freely because you know, I understand the eight inches, but I think there's probably other animals that are taller that wouldn't help. And so if it's a really big array, it might be disrupting the movement of wildlife. So I was wondering, do in really large arrays facilities, do they ever break up the fencing just to let wildlife move through more freely? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you're talking about would only be seen in very, very large projects of which are not permitted in Massachusetts. So not in the distributed generation size projects that we have in the state. Yeah, I would, agree. I, I, would I would offer that, um at least from my understanding of the um, raising these fences six to nine inches off the ground is not, nece not necessarily done along the entire perimeter of the fence. Uh, but uh, I think, and Laura may have better information, but I think, um, and it seems reasonable that, that um, maybe some qualifying language of six to nine inches insufficient um, uh, um, portions of the fence to allow for my uh, wildlife my migration. Um, I, I, I think there's designs where the fence is on the ground, but every every three feet or something, there's a, a, a an area where it's six to nine inches up to allow for migration. I'm not sure technically why one's better than the other, but. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And Martha? Yeah, I have a question then in the opposite direction of whether allowing wildlife traipsing through could really damage the solar panels or anything. <laughs> we we had a an incident when I was working at JPL. There was a nice tall fence around uh, a battery installation and so on. Well, a rac young raccoon climbed the fence, fell in, managed to create a short circuit uh, that oh, <laughs> ruined the setup. Uh, the, the raccoon was not killed but it ended up in rehab with a very burnt nose <laughs> so i just wonder about you know if one allows too much space for wildlife whether one could have something big get in and uh and actually be destructive i, I think the proposal which i think i agree is, is only eligible for much larger arrays was to have like in, in row spacing in between sections of the array that would be um, fenced in a way that that um, wouldn't allow the anim larger animals to get into the array, but to pass through the array along certain rows. I think Martha was even at questioning whether six to nine inches oh, okay. was too oh, much because oh, okay. a raccoon yep. could probably get in nine inches, right? Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's the raccoons definitely... are the ones that do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a... Sorry, I have my hand raised. Oh, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say I think it's really subject to like, like the wildlife biology of the site. It's certainly not done across the board. So that's a mm -hmm. funny story, Martha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if we um, if we should be vaguer about the inches. 
Yeah. Um, and, and let's say, you know, uh, have spacing sufficient for, uh, as determined by, or uh, yeah, I'm not sure who determines that, but. Um, you say the, depending on the move, you know, to accommodate the movement of wildlife and. Well, I would specify the wildlife. We don't want deer and stuff going through there, but, um, but, you know, chickmunks and snakes and um, little uh, critters, turtles, uh, I think particularly. Yeah. Um, I can ask um, one of my colleagues does a lot of work in this area. I can ask her uh, yeah. what, what, um, what's a reasonable uh, if she has a, a sense of, a, of of what sort of standard practice there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, screening. Large-scale ground-mounted solar photovoltaic installation, the large scale, shall be designed to minimize its visibility, including preserving natural vegetation to the maximum extent possible, blending in equipment with the surroundings adding vegetative buffers and or fencing to provide an effective visual barrier from adjacent roads and driveways and from abutting dwellings. The installation shall be effectively screened year round from all public and private ways and from adjacent residential lots. The permit granting authority may alter or waive this requirement if such screening would have a detrimental impact on the operation and performance of the array. Where existing vegetation in the setbacks is insufficient to achieve year-round screening, additional screening shall be provided, including, but not limited to, planting of dense vegetative screening, fencing, berms, use of natural ground elevations, and or land contouring, all depending on site-specific uh, conditions. Tree cutting within the required setback area shall not be permitted if it would reduce to any degree the effectiveness of the year-round screening. However, if there are trees within the screening area that cast shade on the solar panels, they may be removed. That was an issue that Laura brought up last time. Um, okay, and then down, keep going. I guess this is kind of a long section, right? Um, do, does anyone have any questions or comments up to this point? Just, just one comment. So one of the things that you always see in leases, solar land leases, is basically, um, you know, the requirement uh, for quiet enjoyment and the preservation of the solar resource itself. So for example, um, you know, I couldn't be a landowner and give five acres of solar and then build, um, you know, partition off the rest of the land for housing projects that would cast shade on, on the solar facility itself. So I just wanna um, remind everyone that there, you know, we can have, you know, things like preservation of the irradiation to the site is something that is going to be, you know, protected by the contractual language of the, you know, of the lease itself. So, um, but I think this is fine. Okay. Moving on. Uh, um, go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking how a lot of these, uh, uh, the trees that provide a visual barrier, they, they actually need to be trimmed, you know, versus, you know, removed. And that's just like an ongoing process. That's a maintenance issue. Um, so, but you can't just do that. You have to kind of keep up with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we'd encourage the, the owner to, you know, maintain their screen. They would probably do that in order to keep the screen from becoming so tall that it was shaking exactly. the um, panels, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming it was on the uh, south side. <laughs> yep. Mm. Um, uh, if, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Jan Janet. Um, I don't really understand what Laura just said. I, I don't know if it's because I'm note taking and I'm kind of writing and not thinking. But Laura, are you saying that like the landowner who, you know, has a solar array shouldn't put something up that's, you know, shades it? Or are you saying that the people next door can't put something? No, you, you can't yeah. regulate the people next door. It's the former. Okay. Okay. Yeah, who, yeah, but that's a contractual language, probably right from between the uh, solar owner and the landowner. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 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 
Okay, if it, um, we don't have to read through all of this writing in black, but mm -hmm. then we did add a sentence. Applicants are encouraged to install plantings below the array, including native species and pollinator friendly species and species that are supportive of wildlife rather than installing non-vegetative materials such as stone mulch. I think that was something that Duane brought up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would just um, maybe say uh, instead of below the array, um, within the array. Within the array, okay. You know. Yep. Go ahead, Janet. Um, I wonder if we can just require that, that, you know, I would assume that the permit granting authority could require plantings below the array, you know, and they might, I mean, instead of saying we encourage you to, which is nice, just saying we were, you know, the PGA can require plantings below the array with a preference to native species and pollinators and things like that. So kind of giving the PGA the authority to, you know, require plantings below and not just gravel or something. Yeah, so to, to respond to that, um, I have not seen that as a requirement in any of the projects that I've done. I think you have to be careful that anything you plant doesn't grow tall and above the uh, PV panels themselves, but also then you get into language of, okay, who's responsible for maintaining those plantings? Like once that fenced-in area is established, um, the operation and maintenance, you know, I mean, this gets more complicated because who's maintaining those plantings? You know, what's the, I guess my question to you is, you know, what's the purpose of those plantings? You have a solar generating facility, unless you're intending on farming, you know, underneath it, which is still kind of being tested and proven. Um, it's, you know, it, it's a kind of a sensitive topic because nine times out of 10 right now, that fenced in area is required to be, you know, to block out everyone, um, except unless you have very specific contractual language allowing for, you know, the maintenance of, of bees or, or what have you. I think, I think it would be, I think it's okay to say, my suggestion is it's encouraged to plant, you know, native pollinator habitat um, around the, you know, somewhere around the, the solar panels. I think this is good too, because um, there are cases where you might want to have stone mulch for issues of um, stormwater runoff. So um, you can't really like preconceive all of the types of um, issues that may come up for this ground area below and around the array. So here you're saying that you encourage plantings, but you know, in certain in, in certain um, instances, it could be possible that you need to have stone mulch or something more um, inert so that you can maintain it so it doesn't get washed away. Uh, I would think that most um, installers would want to plant something there because it's kind of, it's not that expensive and it's relatively easy to maintain with a brush, you know, a, what do you call it, a weed whacker or something. Yeah, I, I would just add um and i'm sort of trying to be careful with my two hats here because we provide um it's the clean energy extension we provide this state incentivized uh pollinator friendly certification so just to laura's point there is um you know uh there is very specific requirements and best practices that the state offers with regard to um pollinator friendly habitat around PVs. And furthermore, there is an incentive structure um, of an uh, it, it within the SMART program that offsets the cost associated with establishment and maintenance. Um, so um, I, I think, and this is fairly unique in Massachusetts, I think completely unique in Massachusetts that there's actually an incentive. Um, so I, I, I um, and, it's sort of a public service, even though you're not farming, you're providing pollinator friendly habitat, generally wildlife friendly habitat for, for um, songs, uh, uh, birds and so forth as well. Um, so it's something we're trying to encourage. There's actually a lot of, of projects that have, uh, are seeking certification. Um, again, I don't, I'm not sure if it's um, appropriate to require it. 
um, but maybe maybe encourage it or maybe to set it as the uh, as the option of of uh, that you have to opt out get get the okay to opt out from it from the PGA. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Mm. Okay, I I Dwayne, could I? Yeah, oh, yeah, Janet. Uh, go ahead. So, so I I agree. Like, what about you know being giving the PGA the authority to require it, but you know also to not require it because I could see benefits other than wildlife and just having soil and roots and you know it, the array is going to sit there for twenty five or thirty years. That land could be sequestering carbon, and you know water can be coming down, and you know. It, the soil will clean the water and it goes into the um, underground water supply. So I, I do see a benefit to that. And it, I would guess that it would slow runoff. But I mean, I could see Chris's point that maybe there's a situation where you would want to have stones. But I think, you know, I would say let's default to grasses or plants. And then unless it's you know impossible for some reason. So give the PGA the authority to that and assuming they'll do the right thing. Okay, I'll try to figure out a way of saying that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I disagree with that. Um, so I think that it's gonna come down, I think right now, because to Dwayne's point, there's certainly an incentive. In some farms, it makes sense. In some farms, the economics, it doesn't justify it. So I, I don't think it should be a requirement. I think, you know, beyond what we're discussing now, there is a very unique and defined incentive program in the state, Massachusetts only, that basically encourages it economically. Um, so you would think that most developers would tend towards that, um, but in some instances, it's still not economic. So um, you know, I think I think the word encouraged is appropriate, but required, I'm not. I don't feel very comfortable with. We could put strongly encouraged. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, how about in, in um, you know, it's similar to what we had, I think, for um, uh, the wiring uh, that uh, you know, assuming it's technically and economically feasible. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Martha. Yeah. I, on that point, I would I would vote for saying the word encouraged leave it at that because of the SMART program is in fact encouraging it, as Laura says. Uh, but my other question is somewhere in this document, and I don't know whether it's here or not, do we want to say something uh, more basic about preserving the topsoil? I don't know whether this is the relevant place to do so, but it seems that part of the requirements for, for plantings or, or this or that are really to, to preserve the topsoil and not you know, scrape it off, off and uh, so on. So is that part of this section or are we having that as a separate, uh, in a separate place? That might be a separate place, but it would be some, it could be something like um, not allowing um, or requiring balanced cut and fill. So somebody would be discouraged from carting away all the topsoil yes, if he yeah. has to balance cut and fill. And I think yeah, that I, mean, I feel that's really important, but maybe this is not the place. But we we could say something about you know with the plantings and you know it, it, one of the reasons for the for the plantings is to help preserve the the topsoil you know, mm -hmm. and uh, erosion. We could even plant clover, you know, fix the nitrogen, make the soil better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but mm -hmm. okay, okay. Right. Um, so Sorry. it relates to balance of cut and fill. Do the words balance, cut, and fill mean topsoil? What does that mean? It means that, um, well, in some places, you're not allowed to take soil away from a site. Right. And, and that's... you're also not allowed to bring soil in. So you have to use yeah. the soil that's on the site to do the grading. So in that case, you would be dissuaded from carting away all of the um, topsoil because that would be taking soil off the site. Yes. But I'll, I'll think about a way to... Um, talk about that yes okay all right janet um so palmer had a i think like 13 arrays and um they had a lot of problems with um soil being taken off site 
and a lot of erosion and just like, you know, falling on streets. And so they made a rule, just everything has to stay on site and you mm -hmm. can't get away. And so maybe you could find that language in their new bylaw. Um, and I think, I think it was, I'm, I think that involved tree cutting, but I'm not quite sure. So I, I was going to raise that issue later that Martha just raised or like, what do you do with all the removal of the tree stumps and the soil and, you know, where you keep it. And I'd, it'd be interesting to see how different towns address that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to deal with tree tree stumps and what do you call it? Grubbing, clearing <laughs> and grubbing, clearing and grubbing. Okay. All right, and then um, control of vegetation. This is something we talked a lot about last time, and some. Uh, so anyway, synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers may not be used to control vegetation or animals, except as otherwise approved by the permit granting authority. And there was some language in the white paper, uh, Watershed Protection Committee's white paper, having to do with protection of water supply. So that's one thing we need to kind of address in here. But um, it doesn't always, um, these things aren't always adjacent to a water supply. Um, source. Um, and then I think it was Laura who brought up the question of do we are we treating solar installations this the same way or differently from other types of development? And we do allow synthetic um, materials to be used elsewhere in town. So what does that mean as far as prohibiting these things in solar arrays? So that's a question that I have not resolved and that probably should be resolved. Um, then there were some other questions brought up about dual use, and that may be something that would be in a section where we would talk about requirements and may not be in this section because this section is really about how do these places look. And then someone else brought up the issue of maybe we should have a preference for solar installations that include agrivoltaics. I'm not sure exactly how that would work because once, because usually what happens is the um, applicant brings to the permit granting authority what their proposal is. You don't get a choice between, you know, this developer and that developer. So there's really no way of giving a preference to um, one over the other. Would, and so wording may need to be developed here about uh, looking looking positively on installations that include agrivoltaics or something like that. So I'll have to work on that. Okay. So that's all I have for um, this section. And I did have some questions related to other topics that if we have time, we can discuss, but I think Dave Zomek may be waiting in the wings right now. So maybe it's time to bring Dave in and to stop this section. So that's up to Dwayne to decide that. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think your, your set of questions or issues to discuss are really important for us, um, along with maybe what we can keep adding to that list as well, but then we have to sort of get into a discussion about it. Um, and uh, so let's put that on the uh, agenda for next week. Uh, but let me ask uh, Stephanie in terms of whether Dave is available. Yep. So Dave, point. Dave is available, but he's going to be a few more minutes. He's okay. just finishing up another um, meeting. So I would say you have like at least another six minutes. Okay. Um, so, do we want to talk about these questions or talk why about don't we, something uh, else? Uh, I'd be in favor of, of um, uh, looking at the questions and maybe highlighting the ones that we want to uh, um, maybe either have a quick discussion about at this point or that we want to uh, dive into uh, maybe at the next, uh, uh, spend some time on at the next meeting. Okay, so um, I think I sent this email out to everybody um, last night along with the section on design standards. So maybe Stephanie could bring up that um, email and we could look at those questions.
Um, she might have stepped away. Oh, Dwayne, you could bring it up yeah. if you want to, or I could just talk about it. Uh, no, I can bring it up. I'll, um, in fact, why don't I... Um, what time did I send it out? It was 624 last well, I night. Ha I, have, I copied and pasted them into my, my agenda. So why don't I just open that up because it's right in front of me. Um, uh. So, yeah, so different. Um, so, okay, so these were things that I thought would be useful to talk about because I'm not going to just start writing this stuff and then have people be saying, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't even be considering what the maximum size of a solar array is or how much, you know, forest we're allowing to be cut or anything like that. I thought it would be good to have a discussion ahead of time about do we want to do this? And if so, you know, what's the scale of it? So the first one is, um, what what do people have thoughts about what the maximum size of a solar array should be? And various towns do have um, limitations on the size of solar arrays. For instance, Belcher Town says um, the maximum fenced area can be no more than 20 acres and maximum cleared area no more than 10 acres. Other towns have 15 acres as a limit. Um, so does Amherst care about that? Are we interested in limiting the size of the solar array? Or do we think that, you know, if you're going to build one, why don't you build it as large as you can? Um, and then maybe you won't have to build one next door. But I know that Laura has told us that there is a maximum size um, on a property. And I think it's Five is it five megawatts, Laura? It, so it's it's and Laura can correct me, but it's five megawatts AC, yeah. uh, which means that um, it uh, that means uh, it can be larger. The more important thing in terms of acreage is DC capacity because that's the size yeah. of the array. Um, I, a five megawatt AC project with en battery store energy storage or battery storage. Um, could probably go up to about 10 megawatts um, and not put more than five megawatts AC onto the onto the uh, grid at any given point of time. But Laura, is that in line with your understanding? Yeah, and the battery storage footprint um, is very small. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, that's uh, that's correct, and you're right. So the five so, megawatt AC. Yeah would be equal to a 10 megawatt DC? Is that not, how you not necessarily. No, uh, not at all. No. Not, not in Massachusetts, no, no way. No. Okay, is 10 megawatt what? 10 I think megawatts we, all together? Yeah, I think, I, I think the, if we're gonna be consistent with how, so basically, you know, rather than work on the AC-DC conversion, I think we should be consistent with how the state spells out their regulations of system size, um, which is AC. So, and they that's, say that's, that's how that's how utilities look at it. That's how the state looks at it. It's developers and asset owners who look at that DC conversion as well. But when you are, for example, in the smart program, if you are participating in the megawatt block program, you are going to get your incentive based on the AC system size. And did you tell us that the maximum size that you could have? would be five megawatts per property? Per property. Okay. So is that some is that even necessary for Amherst to make such a statement if the state already has that requirement? How big is that in terms of acres? Um, it depends. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna give you that quick conversion right now. Just give me a second. I double check my figure before I go on record saying it. It's about 30 acres. 
30 acres of fenced in area. Mm. 30 acres is the footprint of the project. So fenced in area would be enough. totally varies by project. Uh, okay. So when you say the footprint of the project, you're talking about the area that's actually covered by the arrays plus whatever pertinent equipment they need and a battery storage a, area? A battery would make it a little bit larger, but the battery footprint is pretty small. I mean, pretty typically small. it's, yeah. yeah, typically it's like, you know, placed, you know, between the panels or, you know, it's placed on site. So if Amherst said the maximum size would be 30 acres, is that a reasonable? No, I, no. I, I would, my thought, and everyone's going to have a different opinion here. My thought is, I don't understand why we would, we would create rules that are different than the state of Massachusetts which has thought through these pretty intensely based on the resource in the state um, and the land use. I mean, so for example, in other states where there's, you know, so much more land, you're not going to see a limitation on system size because, for example, in Arizona or Texas or North Carolina, there's a, there's a lot more land, uh, much less densely populated. So... All right, so, yeah, um, and I have some thoughts too, but um, Martha and then Jack. Well, let's see. Well, Dwayne, I think I'd rather wait till your thoughts because I was going to question this conversion and, uh, you know, when you were talking about battery storage. So let you and Jack go first. Well, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I, I thought um, the, when it came to size of the of the project, uh, the the, the the point I thought was interesting that we were discussing was uh, phasing of the project. And so maybe, you know, let's pick a huge one. Say it's a 50 acre project that we were going to encourage them to do it in phases of, you know, say, you know, 20 acre or, or some increment there because of the concern of the, you know, going to the maximum for, for a very large Installation. So I, I recall us talking about that, and I don't know um, if that's something that we're still, mm -hmm. you know, mulling over or not, and and whether that's legitimate with regard to you know state projects and, and what's allowable. But does anybody else recall that? Yeah, I think phasing has to do with um, tree cutting and erosion control, right? More than how much do you want in general to end up with? Okay, there, yes. All right. Yeah, so that's a different topic, I think. So in so Laura is saying, why put a maximum size on a solar array if the state has maximums already? There's no need for Amherst to, to put a maximum size on. And I, I think I agree with that, but do others agree with that? Yes, I, I agree with that. I guess my my thought there is 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 also I mean it seems a bit arbitrary to some extent I mean it, it may turn out that there's a wonderful spot that everybody likes in Amherst that we can uh, really focus our solar uh, capacity on that's sort of out of the way and so forth is just sort of hypothetical and um, would we want to limit that if if it means that we we might save putting it somewhere else um, I just also wanted to you know, just at full tra uh, transparency um, that this five in Lark, I think I have this right, uh, this five megawatt AC limit, the capacity limit uh, that the state has, there's two important issues there. One, it's it's with regard to the smart incentive uh, and, and uh, which is driving solar at the moment. You don't want to drive, you don't want to build a solar project without the smart incentive. Um, but um, um, that is, um, again, that's the AC value. Uh, how, much so how much acreage a project takes up is really based on the DC uh, spec on the project, uh, which with battery storage allows you to um, almost have twice the AC size because um, you run it through the battery and then dispatch it all you know 24 hours in a day as opposed to eight hours in a day um and that's limited to five megawatts with the total array size in dc which is really the square feet of the panels 
is uh, probably up to about 10 megawatts. Yeah, but, the, I, but I think in, in that point, Dwayne, you're right, but I think in that point, the battery footprint is nowhere near as large as the solar footprint. Oh, no, 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 yeah, no, 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 yeah, absolutely. The, the battery's minimal uh, compared to footprint. What I would also suggest or, or, or provide is that there is substantial economy of scale associated with solar. Uh, and so, you know, building them larger saves ratepayers money um, and, and makes projects more, more affordable. Um, uh, and, and so that, that's a factor here in also in terms of thinking about size limits. Yeah, and that's just one more piece. The 30 megawatts, um, excuse me, the 30 acres is for a five megawatt AC project. So just to be, just to clarify, I'm not talking about five megawatts DC. No, no, no. So, okay, Martha. Uh, yeah, okay, so now join the confusion here. So I think what you're saying then is uh, 10 megawatts DC, and I think one generally uses the conversion of each, each, each megawatt of DC is about between four and five acres typically. Not right. No. Oh, so in Massachusetts, like in this area, as panels become more efficient, which is what we're seeing. So I realized I haven't had my camera. On. Um, as panels become more efficient, we're seeing 30 megawatts on average. Excuse me, 30 acres on average for a five megawatt AC project. That yeah. does not include battery storage. Right. 30 acres for five megawatt AC, but but Dwayne, you're saying you could double that by by having the battery storage and then you know distributing the power over 24 hours. So that would mean 60 acres. No, no, we can double the production, not the influence. That's what I want to make sure with Dwayne, your comment wasn't clear. The the this is an important piece. Yeah. The solar panel footprint requires mm -hmm. far more land than the battery storage footprint. Battery storage footprint, uh, I got to get this ratio, but like I've seen, you know, I, I don't, but like, you know, 10 megawatts of battery in like a half acre parcel. So yeah, you got to think of battery storage in the form of like the eight, like the mat, like the 18 wheeler trucks, they fit on those trucks. Yeah. So it's not like, a, anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that, but but what I mean is, uh, you know, the the state has a limit of how much uh, energy one can put out over the wires at a certain time, and I think if I understand correctly, and so that's where that five uh, megawatts AC comes from. And I, if I understand correctly, Dwayne is saying, ah, but you don't put the whole amount that you're generating out. At, during the daylight, you store it in your battery, which means that you could have a larger total output and then, you know, slowly dish it out over the 24 hours onto the wires. And so that's why I was asking, could that then mean that, in fact, one could have a larger acreage of the actual solar panels generating electricity because you're going to store it? And not have to send it over the wires immediately, yeah. And and so from from that, I would say I would be in favor of stating a maximum acreage in our uh, solar bylaw. But that does not mean a restrictive one like Shootsbury's. It would mean something that could be fairly large, but still, uh, you know clear that if the state SMART program changes its rules, we would have some fairly large, but still specific uh, size limit. So that's just my opinion. But I think we've still got some confusion there about even within the state regulations, um, how large a solar array could be in acreage, as long as you maintain the state limit in how much you're sending out per hour onto the onto the wires. Is that right? <laughs> can I, can I um, yeah, I've made it more we, confusing. Yeah, I realize. And I think th this is obviously a, a really important point for us to deliberate on and discuss. 
Um, I do see Dave is, uh, has joined us, which uh, I really appreciate and, and want to um, use his time um, as effectively and, and uh, optimally as we can. So um, I, I'd like to move, move forward in the agenda. We can return to this time permitting or this and the other list of questions, which I'll now stop sharing um, that um, Chris has teed up for us and we can add to as time goes on. Um, I think um, it is, uh, we'll need to return to that and want to return to that in subsequent meetings. So um, if, if uh, so let's move, move on with the, uh, with, uh, with the agenda and move to, to Dave Zomack, um, who is the um, assistant town manager and the director of conservation and development for the town of Amherst. Um, Dave, really appreciate you spending your time with our uh, working group. Um, and um, I'll, uh, unless uh, Stephanie, if you wanted to say anything as introduction, um, but otherwise we'll move move on with uh, with Dave. Nope. <laughs> sure. Okay. Great. Thanks, Dwayne, and and thanks everybody for having me. And and I'm happy to come back. I mean, this doesn't have to be a one and done. I mean, this is what we all do, and I'm happy to be with you and and engage with uh, with the working group and. Um, yeah, I, I don't have anything formal. What I do want to do is, you know, I, I, I did prepare some remarks and I think at some point I will um, ask Stephanie, not yet, but at some point we'll we'll take a look at the um, protected open space map from the open space and recreation plan. But again, I'm, I do, I did get uh, throughout the week some of your questions. So I'm, I'm hoping that some of the remarks I make will address some of the questions that the working group has, but I want to leave enough time really, you know, and I'm happy to stay with you as long as you'd like today. I'd really like to open up enough time for, for a Q and a uh, for you to hit me with those questions. And if we don't know the answers, you know, um, Stephanie and I will go back and, and we'll, we'll find them for you and either I can come back or we'll answer them via email. But um, but let me, if I could, I'll, I'll just kind of launch in and and then we'll take a look at the uh, the map. I think from generally from the questions that I saw coming from the working group, there were kind of a lot of questions and and a lot of focus on you know what's out there, what's what's available both uh, as unprotected land, but but then what are our land resources that are already protected? So what I wanted to do is make a few remarks very briefly, and, and I can move quickly, talk about kind of the history of land conservation in Amherst, and then um, we'll talk about the map, the open space map, and then open it up for, for a QA. and a um, I did want to reference, all of this stuff is online on our website. Uh, the best resource, really, the last update to the open space plan was done late 2017-18, uh, we've we've done a few update or uh, updated a few of the sections since then, but um, the open space and recreation plan has all of this information, all of the things I'm going to talk about. They're all there in the maps. The data is all there. The management plans are all there. So um, it's all there. If you miss something or want to go a deeper dive, look at that open space and recreation plan. Um, I'm going to talk. I'm going to throw out some numbers today, but they are not exact numbers, you know, uh, please don't use these down to the acre because we have not updated those numbers um, in a long time. They're, they're going to be fairly accurate. Um, but, but, you know, if I say, you know, one category I'm looking at has 18, 1,828 acres, we might have, you know, 10 more by now, but It'll give you general uh, general ballpark figures for the protected ca the categories of protected open space. Really quickly, um, I just wanted to you know take this opportunity. You know, so in the early years here in Amherst, which I was not part of, you know, I haven't been with the town that long, um, but you know, in the early years of uh, of conservation here. Um, the focus was really on, and the fear really was on the loss of open space subdivisions you know, how quickly we were losing land, open land, ecologically significant land to development in the 60s, primarily in the 60s and 70s and early 80s. Uh, people like Pete Westover, who was the conservation director here for 30 years, was one of the, the leaders in land conservation in Massachusetts and in New England. 
And, you know, through the work of the Conservation Commission, the Select Board, and ultimately town meeting, uh, Amherst was a, a very early leader in, in land conservation. So that goes back, you know, we really started protecting land through gifts and, and a proactive land uh, acquisition program um, probably 50 years ago or so. So, so we've been doing this a long time. But the early initiatives were about the threat, the loss of, of open space, the loss of farmland. A second pulse was really that protection of, of farmland. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has this very, very successful program called the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. And this is a, basically a program where the state matches local dollars to bring together uh, when a town, a city or town uh, would like to protect um, active farmland, they can apply, they with the owner of the land can apply for funding. Uh, typically municipalities uh, use uh, Community Preservation Act funds to match uh, the state dollars. And basically what this is, is it's buying the development rights for a particular piece of farmland from a private owner. These are all voluntary applications. Um, in Amherst, again, I can talk numbers in just a minute. We've been very successful in this program at acquiring the development rights for a few thousand acres of, of prime farmland. Um, it's really important in that category to remember that the farmland stays in private hands. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So early years were about threat to development. APRs came on the scene. We also took early initiatives here in Amherst to protect water supply land. So those lands that help to uh, keep our water clean and provide clean drinking water for all the residents and visitors to Amherst. So we have water supply uh, land, um, you know, a few hundred acres of water supply land. And again, Amherst was very proactive in, in going out there and purchasing those lands. And then more recently in my time, um, working on land acquisition here, we've really kind of focused more on strategic acquisitions. Early in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, even in the 90s, uh, the town was likely to accept, for instance, open space that came as the result of subdivision, sub essentially subdivision open space. And they, these were kind of the remnants when land was, was developed into um, commercial um, or, or residential uh, developments. And during my time, we've tried to be much more strategic in uh, acquiring land for a lot of reasons. One is that, um, frankly, a lot of the land that that um, um, has come before us in these more recent years may not fit into one of the important categories. It may not be important uh, wetland resource areas or or uh, provide protection for rivers or streams, and it may not be prime farmland. Um, I think in the last couple of years, our, our land protection program has been kind of plateauing. And again, uh, we've been really focused on strategic acquisitions. I think the Hickory Ridge project is probably the best example of that. That's 150 acres uh, that we purchased. We just actually closed on that in 2022, but it was about a four or five year uh, project to get there. And that really provides kind of multiple uh, town purposes and multiple town priorities. Um, but again, we're very strategic in what we acquire for the town or um, what we support in terms of land conservation. And honestly, part of the reason for that is that um, we have a shrinking tax base, right? Um, the more land we take off the, the tax rolls, um, the, the larger the burden is for those uh, remaining uh, taxpayers. Um, before we uh, uh, take a look at the map, I did want to point out that uh, a point always that I make is that, you know, those those early folks in Amherst who were so forward thinking, um, you know, uh, really, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're enjoying the benefits of all of the work that they did to protect this open space, to protect the, the critical farmland, to keep farms uh, active and vibrant and viable in Amherst. Um, but it also makes our jobs easier, your job easier, all of our jobs easier as we think of climate change, because without those early efforts, we would have far more homes to heat, 
businesses to heat. So our carbon footprint would be much larger than it is today had not those early uh, folks in Amherst really thought, how do we protect these important areas uh, that provide farmland, provide food, um, but also connect our neighborhoods, connect our schools with trails and, and other uh, natural uh, features. So we owe a lot to uh, the, the concoms of the past and town meeting and whatnot. In fact, Amherst, just one side note, Amherst was one of the first communities, maybe one of the only communities in Amherst that protected land before the CPA was enacted. The Community Preservation Act was enacted in about 2002 or three, but we were protecting land, you know, decades before that. And, you know, I attributed a lot of that to those, those folks uh, who, who worked so hard to, to protect land back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So Steph, maybe you could pop up that map very quickly. So we're not gonna go through this in great detail, but I think this is your best resource for those members of the, of the working group or for, um, for anyone um, you know, uh, out there in the audience. Um, this is map number seven in our open space and recreation map. And this is really kind of the, this is the puzzle, right? This is what we, we all, we refer to staff and committees and boards as we're looking at the town of Amherst. Um, and, and I'm sure you all have seen this map, um, but many committees look at it when, when they have goals and objectives that they'd like to achieve. Um, where do we, you know, when we look for anything, new, a new school site, a new DPW site, a new fire station site, um, if we're looking for, uh, you know, in this case, if we're talking about solar, where can solar go? And what are the, the restrictions on certain pieces of property uh, where solar may not be able to go because those restrictions uh, don't allow it. So, you know, very quickly, the major categories on this open space map, and I'm, we're not going to go through all of them, but I, I know you, by your questions, wanted to focus on, you know, the big ones are conservation, which is in green. The APR land is in orange, if you will, the yellowish, yellowish orange. Water supply, our water supply lands are all in Lawrence Swamp in South Amherst because that's where our wells are. Um, and then conservation restrictions, those are pieces of private property that are protected by a restriction that the town or the state holds. And then lastly, um, state land. And we have a couple of categories of state land in town. You're well aware that the university has about a thousand acres of land that they they um, call their own, the Commonwealth's land. But the, the other important category is on the, if Steph, you go south, if you could uh, scroll for us, you can see the brown, that's the Mount Holyoke Range State Park. So all of those parcels in brown are held by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in perpetuity for open space and um, uh, ecological uh, purposes. So, those are the major categories. We've been proactive, as I said, buying conservation land, just to give you some ballpark numbers. Um, so for agricultural preservation restrictions, we're at about 2000 acres, a little over 2000 acres in APRs. Now, again, those are privately held parcels. Those are taxed parcels, but they're not owned by the town. They're owned by private individuals, farmers and others who continue to farm those 2,000 plus uh, acres. The Commonwealth is almost, almost 1,000 acres, uh, principally on the Mount Holyoke Range. Conservation in green is about 1,900 acres. So all of those green parcels in aggregate are about 1,900 acres. We have about 200 acres of conservation restrictions. Again, these are held by the town or the Commonwealth on private land. And then water department, these are the water supply protection parcels, which are in blue in the lower right-hand corner. Thank you, Steph. Uh, those are about 300 acres and those surround our wells in Lawrence Swamp. So those are the main kind of categories I wanted to go through with you. 
Um, I know people asked about chapter land, chapter 61. And chapter 61, just we, we shouldn't spend too much time on chapter 61, but chapter 61 is a tax classification that gives the owners of those parcels um, a reduced tax uh, rate if they agree to keep their land open uh, for a period of time. Uh, it is not a permanent classification. Um, those parcels can be taken out of chapter, we, we call it. Um, and they often are. They're, they're sold, they're purchased by developers, they're purchased by other owners, and those are removed from chapter. Um, chapter lands on here, chapter 61A is the cross-hatched, kind of orangish brown stuff. Maybe you could find one of those parcels right in the center. There we go, um, in, in that area. So why don't I stop here, Dwayne? I'd rather, I'd, I'd love to get into Q and A's and I'll do the best I can with, with questions that the working group might have, um, but I didn't want to take a long time on kind of the, the broad overview. Great, thank you, Dave. Yeah, it's been great. <clears throat> um, let me open it up uh, to, to the group uh, for questions. Um, uh, we have the questions that we, um, I think Dave did a good job probably covering a lot of the questions we pre-submitted. Uh, but we can look at those as well as any additional questions or um, more detail uh, of what they've uh, put forward so far. So uh, Martha and then Jack. Can, I'm sorry, Duane, before you ask questions um, or get questions, do you want me to continue displaying the map or would you like me to close that? It's My guess is the map will remain helpful. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, okay, well, thank you. Dave, I'd be interested to know just a little more specifics about the type of farms we have and how big they are. I mean, my initial looking through looked like we have some dairy farms, some horse boarding uh, with hay fields and many vegetable type gardens. I wondered if you could just say a little more about the types of farming, because that kind of determines what types of solar they might be interested in. Yeah, that's a great question, Martha, and I see it on the list, and and I'm glad you you brought it back here. Um, so yeah, we unfortunately we don't have data on every farm in Amherst. One of the questions was how many separate farms do we have? I typically use a number around 45, but again, what defines a farm is a, is a little bit amorphous. You know, you might have somebody who who you know is simply the owner of either a preserved or not preserved piece of farmland in Amherst, and they might be growing things themselves. They might be growing things for commercial or wholesale markets, um, or they might be leasing their land to another farmer. So defining what a farm is is a little bit difficult for us here in Amherst, but I typically say there's about 45 to 50 different farms and again, what they grow is is pretty diverse. So the best soils in Amherst for growing vegetables are really up in, up on in the northwest corner of town. And maybe Stephanie could could uh, uh, pan up in that corner because it's not showing now. There it is. It's up in those yellow uh, off of Meadow Street. Those are the best soils in Amherst. Um, in the in the upper left hand corner in orange, keep going stuff. Yes, over in that area, those are the best soils, and those farms grow onions, <laughs> historically cucumbers. Uh, many row crops are grown up in that area. Um, I should say that a, a major component of our farm system now are CSAs, community supported agriculture operations, and again, there's some that are smaller where. I think the two that are most prominent are Brookfield Farm and of course, um, North Amherst Community Farm uh, up in, in the center of North Amherst. So our best soils are up there off of Meadow Street and most of the land up there. Um, and this map I can see is a little dated because we've actually, uh, some of that chapter 61 land since this map was produced is now um, uh, APR'd. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, and then down off of Northeast Street, and Southeast Street were historically uh, dairy farms. We had, again, we had 55 plus dairy farms in Amherst at one time. A lot of reasons why dairy farms um, 
don't dot the New England landscape as much as they used to, but certainly competition and pricing, you know, had a lot to do with that. Um, but a lot of those farms have now had to shift gears and try to find other ways to to make a living because dairy is is very challenging in Massachusetts. We only have one dairy farm left in Amherst, um, and that's over at J and J Farm on Meadow Street. So we are down to the last dairy um, uh, with with active dairy milking, et cetera. Um, so again, tobacco is a major cash crop in Amherst to this day. Um, but again, things like, as I mentioned before, um, you know, certainly, um, certainly onions, squash, um, you know, wholesale and retail tomatoes. We also have a lot of um, new additions to the landscape uh, in the form of, of hoop houses, basically temporary greenhouses as a way to extend the New England uh, growing season. So up in North Amherst, you have great examples of that um, uh, at a couple of farmers off of Russellville Road and Meadow Street. And they are very actively providing uh, organic greens to, um, to supermarkets as well as um, markets in Boston and New York. Um, so you, you see farmers trying to be innovative and get grants for these uh, temporary um, greenhouses that help them extend their growing season and, and be more profitable. Um, what else? Other questions? Yeah, from uh, Jack. So I uh, want to wish you a happy St. Patrick's Day, Dave. You have a nice Irish name like me, I can see. Um, with an hmm. E-K. Not exactly, but, but yes, okay. Yeah, I'm not wearing any green today. I might have missed the memo. Neither am I. <laughs> um, so I, I have a couple of questions for you, but um, the APR land and the Chapter 61A, how are they uh, exclusive of one another? And, and then... And then how was how are all these things kept track? It's just because the town needs to know with with regard to you know when they're assessing properties, they need to know these these things are on file for the for the town. So sure. So yeah. I'll answer the second question first. So um any permanent restriction, be it an APR or a conservation restriction, or when the town acquires a piece of property, you know, that follows a path through you know, through a closing, through recording at the Registry of Deeds, and then our town assessor will get that information. And then working with our, our IT folks, um, the parcel will be recoded in our GIS system. So again, this is a static map from the Open Space and Recreation Plan. But if you go to, you know, the parcel I, I was just noticing up in North Amherst, I know it's part of the Mitchell Farm. And since this map was produced, the Mitchell Farm, um, another 30 or 40 acres of it, um, was put into the APR program by the family and the town and, and others contributed to that process. So um, if you go to our GIS system, it'll have the most up-to-date information on what parcels are permanently protected and what aren't. So we could, we could, we could pick this, uh, this layer, you know, the various layers that are turned on in the GIS, and we could produce a map today, this moment of what parcels are permanently protected, either owned by the town, uh, already sold their development rights through the APR program, or have a conservation restriction, or any of the other categories here. So that's the most up-to-date information. And then that information then runs with the deed. So the next purchaser, the next person who purchases, a, say, a, a farm, a piece of farmland in Amherst, they would presumably know if their eyes are open and they're going into something, you know, uh, like purchasing, a, you know, a 40 acre um, piece of farmland in South Amherst, they would know going in that that land is permanently protected. They might approach the town and say, what can or can't I do on that property? Um, the most common thing we get is, can I build a house on an APR? Um, and unless, unless there's a house lot excluded, on an APR property, it is very difficult to build a house on an APR. Um, 
your second question was kind of, Jack, how does the, how does chapter 61A and the APR program, um, so I'm not exactly sure, let me take a stab at that question, but so from a planning standpoint, we look at chapter 61A and we say, you know, if, if we turn on that layer on the GIS, we can see, we, we, the conclusion we would draw is the chapter 61A properties um, A, our farmland, and B, our, our unprotected. They don't have a permanent restriction. So that's where we look to say, what are the remaining priority pieces of agricultural land that we think uh, deserve and are worthy of protection? And so there would be other layers that we would turn on, if you will, in helping us make that decision. Uh, prime soils would be important, contiguous to other APR permanently protected lands, a willing seller, right? The town cannot dictate what the owner of property A or property B does with their land. The owner, if they come to us and say, I'd like to protect the uh, my property, then we embark on a process with them. We approach the state with them and we say, hey, this, this property owner, this farmer would like to protect their land. Um, but it's a voluntary program and the owner has to be willing to give up some rights and accept um, a certain amount of money for those development rights. So chapter 61A is a tool we use to kind of look at the whole town and, um, and see what other pieces of property are remaining that are not presently protected. Again, I'm gonna give you a ballpark. Please do not you know, quote me on this, but there are there are a few hundred acres of land left in chapter 61A that are unprotected, that have prime soils and would fit some of those, those characteristics that I just mentioned, you know, contiguous with other APR lands, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying all, you know, three to 400 of those acres would rise to the top of that priority list, but there are some farms that you know, we still would like to protect in town because they have prime soils, um, they're part of an agricultural block, um, and they're worthy of protection. There are other, you know, five acre parcels or 10 acre parcels or 15 acre parcels that may not, you know, make the cut, honestly. But but 61A is really, it's, it's more uh, for tax purposes for the individual property owner, they will claim that 61A and they have to do that on, you know, obviously on an annual basis. Yes. And if they choose to take their property out of chapter 61A, a couple of things happen depending, there's a lot of nuances here and I don't think we have time to get into them now, but um, a landowner would likely owe a certain number of years in back taxes. And in some cases, the town has the right of first refusal. The town can step in if they're going to sell their property and develop it. There is a mechanism by which the town can step into that um, that process, and and uh, it's called a right of first refusal. So we would have a right of first refusal on some of those lands. Okay, so I, just one more question since I have you. Then mm -hmm. I, I think you're probably going to have to come back, Dave. Oh sure, <laughs> I got it. Happy, I got happy it. To. But so my my question is, when it comes to zoning, uh, and bylaw protection, um, when I look at farmland, I see this farmland conservation overlay district, and it doesn't coincide at all. It, it doesn't seem like it coincides at all with with this particular map that's up um, there. So from a zoning perspective. It, it seems like they're, it's a different, well, maybe you could just explain what the far, farmland conservation overlay district is, because that's the only oh. agricultural oriented zoning designation that I saw. I think you would find more correlation. This doesn't have that overlay turned on on it. It's obviously a static map focused on what's protected in town and what isn't. I think you'd find more correlation than you think. I would defer to Chris because she works every day with zoning and applicants more than I do. But Chris, I don't know if you want to say anything more or or could help us more on the F's, you know, the farmland overlay. May I, Duane? Um, 
I think I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, so farmland conservation land is a zoning designation that um, requires that if you are to develop land in that overlay zone, that you develop it in a certain way, which is by um, con uh, cluster subdivision rather than standard subdivision. And cluster subdivision ends up with some land protected either as um, either as farmland or as conservation land or whatever. There was a recent uh, project that was um, developed in that way down in South Amherst, um, where, where the uh, developer gave land, eventually gave land to the town. So it's really um, a mechanism to control development more than, um, and, and to control development to keep large areas of land open for farming or for conservation, um, but uh, it doesn't really mean that those acres would, would be necessarily farmed. So it's separate from what we're looking at now on this um, map that is related to the uh, open space and recreation plan. Does that explain it? Yes, thank you. So I'll, I'll pass for now with regard questions. May I say something as long as I had yeah, the floor please. just briefly? Yeah. I wanted to point out that some of these lands that are in chapter are also owned by the institutions, like mm -hmm. some of the lands I think in the center of um It's a good point. Town, yeah. You know, good in point, Chris. Amherst College has yeah. some of their right. lands in chapter 61A. So mm -hmm. when you see those lands with the cross hatching, those are, you know, probably unlikely to be developed as I mean, they might be developed for institutional uh, reasons, but most likely those lands won't be developed in the future. Mm -hmm. That's all. Great. Um, Martha, let's go with you. And then uh, I'd like to um, move on and and and, and uh, keep in mind Dave's um, suggestion yeah. that he can, can come back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. I just, just ask, it's my understanding then that for APR lands, the state then has certain requirements on the solar development that that uh, solar can only be, I think, something like twice as much as the farm actually uses or something like that. So it's just the general answer. Is it, is it true that the, the state then has rather uh, strict limitations on the solar development for APR land? They do. Yeah, Martha, they do. And, and we they have... Um a whole document, Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program Guidelines. Yes, and this is available online. Essentially what the APR program is saying is, you know, um, Commonwealth tax dollars, all of our tax dollars fund the APR program. There's also federal funds that go into that program and CPA dollars are essentially from residents of Amherst. So all of those funds combined, uh, are brought together to buy the development rights from farmers, from those farmers who are interested in protecting their land. And so the, the APR program is saying, we're open to solar being part of an APR, but they have a process by which you go through to uh, for, the, for the state. And, and actually the town gets involved in that. I've been involved in a couple here in town where this, uh, the applicant, the owner of the farm applies for um, permission to put solar panels on their farm. And clearly what, what the state and the town doesn't want that owner to do is put the solar panels out in the middle of the most productive fields. So it's pretty common sense. Typically what you would do is you would cluster, you would figure out where to cluster the solar panels with the right exposure around your farm operations. So we have farmers who process food, who use a lot of electricity in that. Clearly, there are electrical needs for their barns, for their animals, for their houses on APRs or adjacent APRs. So the state has a whole process by which um, you can go through that and, and get approval. So I think we need, I would just put a plug in there for farm viability. We need to be looking just like we do for our residences, you know, we need to be open to actively working with farmers to figure out ways to make their operations sustainable long term. And so it makes sense to, to come up with ways to add solar to these farm operations without compromising the prime farm soils, uh, which is why you know they're, they're preserved in the first place. But prime soils do no good if the farm itself is not viable. So if we can cut down on electrical costs and, and um, uh, 
um, help these farmers uh, keep costs down. They can produce food for all of us that is uh, reasonable and affordable. So uh, there's there's ways to compromise and plan these systems to support these farms. So anything we put in the bylaw, then we would want to have be consistent with the state guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The the other thing I would just say again, as we run out of time, um, you know. I think as we look at this map and as we look at the, the town map moving forward, I think the future of land protection and and you know it's always been about compromise. And, and so we've done a really good job. Amherst has been and continues to be a, a leader in land preservation. We we got in the game earlier than many other many other towns in the Commonwealth. Do we still have some land to protect? Yes, we. I think there are some priorities, and we should look at those. But there are ways to compromise. We're doing we're doing this now with affordable housing more than ever. That uh, let's say you have a thirty acre piece of property, and we have a couple of these that are kind of perhaps in the works. Are there ways to carve off five acres, seven acres on the frontage? Use that for affordable housing or a combination of affordable and market rate housing or workforce housing, depending on how you define that, and then protect the back land along the Fort River or the Mill River. And likewise, I think there's ways to do that with solar. Um, again, we've, we've as you look at the map, you know, and you have 2000 acres of protected farmland, 2000 acres roughly of protected um, uh, municipal open space, conservation land, and then the other categories, the map, uh, the puzzle pieces of the map are filling in pretty quickly. How do we find compromise in that? There may be ways to do joint projects where you protect part of the parcel and then you put solar on the other part. Great, thank you so much, Dave. Um, and I think we may um, uh, deliberate on, 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 on this discussion a little bit next time and then maybe have some additional questions or follow up with you uh, if you're so willing uh, would sure. be, be fantastic. Were there any burning questions, yeah. Dwayne, just that anybody that I didn't touch on or we didn't touch on that might help you as you move forward? Um, Go ahead, Janet. I was, you know, so just from, I'm, you know, I've only been in town for 20 years, um, but it seems to me just from, you know, walking around and looking around and is, it seems to be more and more land in what I think of as active cultivation. Um, and, you know, there's more CSAs, there's, you know, you know, in South Amherst, like on um, Stanley Street, the Wentworths are, you know, cultivating acres. I don't know who's doing Amherst nursery. Um, you know, on Northeast Street, there's just a million beef cows when there used to be like 30, you know, and I, it just seems to me that the whole farm economy is growing in Amherst and more and more land is being used um, actively. And then there's many acres, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe that along 116, like Hampshire College land that is just sort of sitting fallow. But so, so is my impression, like, do you have a way of saying, yeah, 20 years ago, we had X farms or, it, I mean, is more land being farmed? I know Brookfield has been leasing lands and just bought some. And, and one farmer recently said, you know, most of the farmers you're looking at don't own the land they're on. They're mostly leasing lands from the owners and things like that. So I just... Yeah. Is that impression accurate? Yeah. Um, in general, I think the those 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 comments are are accurate, Janet. Um, uh, a couple of things. One, land is very hard to get into onto in Amherst, but in the region in general. So, newer generations of uh of farmers in in the valley are having trouble. That's one of the the ceilings. Really, is they can't get on land. Land values as we know, are really high. And whether it's an APR farm or a non-APR farm, a non-protected farm, it is very difficult for newer farmers, younger farmers, if you will, coming into the, the field to get on the land. I think your observation about creativity in Amherst, farmers are getting more creative in Amherst. Recall that I said at one point, Amherst had about 50 plus dairy farms. A mm -hmm. lot of our soils are rather wet with yes. a heavy clay content those farms don't necessarily lend themselves well to high product productivity with regard to uh, row crops and higher value crops, but we're getting more and more creative. You know, Dan Kaplan, who, who shepherded uh, um, uh, uh, Brookfield for so many years, has done remarkable things down in southeast Amherst with the soils there. 
to actually help them be more productive. So I think we are seeing more creativity in, in uh, activating some of these old dairy farms and some of these farms that may not have been as productive as, as perhaps we would have thought they would be over the last 20 years. So I think that's a, that's a trend. Hampshire College does have a tremendous amount of, of um, they are the largest, I would say they're the largest single landowner of remaining unprotected farmland in Amherst. Um, so um, they have the Hampshire College Farm Center, which is an active part of their campus and part of their curriculum there. Um, but those those lands, those fields off of West Street, you know, are they are farmed. They're mostly uh, used for grazing cattle and grazing sheep and producing hay. Um, so so that's a big part of the. If you look at the remaining lands that could be protected. Certainly Hampshire has some land. Amherst College, as Chris Brestrup pointed out, also has some farmland that is unprotected. Is it likely to go anywhere in the near future to development? Probably not. But if you think about looking long-term in perpetuity, yeah, we probably should, should have those conversations. Okay. I think we need to have you back, Dill. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to come back. Yeah, yeah. There's so this much is, information that we don't have. This is fun. This is what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy to happy to come back next meeting or whenever you'd like. So great. thank you all. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. And we'll connect with uh, Stephanie on that to, to arrange arrange that. But I think uh, we'll probably deliberate a bit on this next time, and then and then uh, uh, soon soon thereafter. I think uh, having you back would be um, really helpful. Sure. Great. Thank you all. Have a nice weekend. You too, Dave. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, Great. Let me, um, uh, given given that we're uh, actually now officially over time, I did want to get, give the uh, public an opportunity to make any com provide any comments or or questions for us. Hey, if anyone from the public would like to make a comment, please electronically raise your hand. I don't see anyone. Okay. And just for the record, we have seven. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, seven. Seven. Uh, uh, people attending, which is great. Um, and thank you uh, for attending. Um, okay. Um, there was one um, one thing maybe to go over just real quickly and that uh, Janet brought up was the uh, the idea similar to other quote unquote, not quote unquote, but real experts that we've invited uh, to speak to us. Um, uh, there is a... Um, a proposal from Janet on the table to bring in somebody that can speak specifically about forest uh, and forest land. Um, the the uh, recommendation was John, Jonathan um, Bakken on the last name. I think it's Thompson, but Thompson, I mean... yep, yep, from, from Harvard <laughs> Forest, who I who I recognize. Uh, I don't know him, but I recognize the name. Um, but um, uh, do people would people find that helpful? Um, is that information that we think? we need or could Dave Zomack cover some of that? Um, and is that worth, um, uh, would people find find that useful um, to us as we <clears throat> deliberate on, on, the, uh, on the bylaw? Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not knowledgeable on what he would provide. Maybe Janet can. So he um, is at the Harvard Forest, which is um, on the other side of the Quabbin. And they've been, you know, they're tracking the forest, obviously, and studying it. But they're also tracking um, CO2 emissions. And he, his area is, you know, you know, obviously the forest, the New England forest, the role of forests in climate change. And um, so he, he's just like, an, I've seen him speak. He's just an excellent speaker. And he could talk about the importance of forests or what they do um, in terms of sequestration and all the many um, benefits of forests, because that's going to be sort of a piece of what we'll be looking at. And I think he'd be good for questions. Great, Laura, and then and then Martha. Sorry, I didn't see the order. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm all for having subject matters come and talk to the group, but I just want to make sure. And Jenna, I don't know the individual that you're speaking about, but I want to make sure everyone is balanced in terms of what they're bringing um, to the table because we have very limited time uh, left to get our work done. Um, so I think that's my only caveat here. You know, I think when we're talking about 
there, you're not going to get any sort of pushback from this group of the value of forest lands. But my personal opinion is also has to be balanced with, um, you know, the climate benefits of solar. And I think we're all mostly on the same page there. So that's my two cents. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what he'll say. I mean, I've seen him speak. And um, I also was thinking it'd be good to have somebody who owns a forest and manages it. Um, and so I could look around for that. I've also been talking to different farmers in the area and some uh, doing dual use and not doing dual use. And just, you know, like when talking to Dave, just seeing what people face day to day and what, you know, different constraints. And so I actually think it's better not to have somebody with like all opinions, but people with different opinions. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, if you want to get a, a summary of what farmers are facing, there's plenty of, you know, um, plenty of surveys out there from national farm associations that speak to that. So, I mean, I just, I, I think my question is always going to be, what did, what does this group hope to get out of that call? And if we have specific goals, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I think one suggestion might be to, uh, you know, work through the bylaw a bit more in earnest over the next month or so and, and, and identify specific questions that we feel like um, experts could be helpful for us as we deliberate. Um, I, I would tend to agree that, you know, experts are great and, you know, who, who doesn't like listening to experts, um, um, but is it real, um, you know, again, as, as Laura said, I don't think any of us are doubting the importance of forests. On, on, on carbon issues, water quality uh, issues and so forth. Um, so what 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 specific kernels of, of information or questions um, are we really trying to uh, gain some expertise uh, in helping us? Uh, but let me go on to Martha. Yeah, yeah, I just I would just say that I would be in favor of, of having the Mr. Thompson come and, and speak to us. I think that that would be informative. I mean, just like Dave's telling us about farmland, we get some information about forest land. But I think my, my biggest concern is that we can't really come to conclusions about our bylaw until we've seen the GZA report, which apparently isn't going to come until late April to, to May. Uh, I mean, I've seen today that really you know, we need people like me really need to go to our town maps and and study them a little more and so on. But I think in the meantime, having the somebody come and tell us about forests sooner rather than later might be helpful. And then we get on to diving into our our, our mapping and our uses and uh, understanding better of which areas are available in Amherst. So, you know, also I would be really uncomfortable in making decisions about. Solar and cameras without talking to farmers. It's it seems, you know, it's just odd to me, you know. And every time I've had a conversation with somebody, I'm like, oh, this makes sense, or this about dual use and you know, all this stuff. And so I'm having these conversations with people that are really helpful and interesting to me. And I, I want to bring that to the group. Um, it just makes sense that local people would have local knowledge and help us um craft our, our decisions. Yeah, I mean, Jen, and I think that's the whole purpose of the survey, because conversations with individuals, I talk to farmers all day long, just to preface this, um, and each farmer doesn't represent the group as a whole. So, you know, I'm just very cautious of, you know, bringing one, I mean, bringing one person to the table and then extrapolating that it's the perspective of all farmers in the region. So. My understanding was that was the intent of the survey itself was to get the broader public opinion. Um, so anyways, that's my. Uh... I'm going to just jump in and remind people to please let Dwayne acknowledge you to speak because people are jumping in and talking back and forth and you really should be acknowledged by Dwayne. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, Chris, you are so acknowledged. <laughs> so I just wanted to mention the fact that um, to make blanket proclamations or restrictions or whatever about farmland or forest isn't really useful because all the farmland isn't the same and all the forest isn't the same and there may be forests that we think would be fine to be you know sacrificed if you want to use that word to putting a solar array in but there may be forests that we think are sacrosanct and we really should save them and and how do we figure that out so um i'm 
I am cautious, reluctant, however you want to say it, about making these blanket, not these blanket, because we haven't made any statements yet, but making blanket restrictions about, you know, no forests can be cut, no farmland can be touched. So I just wanted to say that, that we have to be judicious about how to how to make these determinations and how to describe these things. And if there are people out there who can help us to figure out how do we describe a forest that we don't want to be cut? And how do we describe a forest that we think, okay, that one might be uh, allowed to be cut? You know, that's a question that we really need to talk about. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And those are the types of questions I wouldn't mind being up for an expert, as opposed to just having them come and talk generally about their research. Mm -hmm. um, somebody had their hand up. I, I'm sorry, um, but maybe put it down. So, um, any let's um, not move on this uh, uh, quite yet um, uh, and and give us the opportunity to, um, I think without a guest speaker uh, next time uh, to make some uh, headway, um, assuming Chris has the opportunity um, uh, on the on the bylaw, uh, which is obviously really important and to keep sort of tagging or, or, or flagging these specific questions that we uh, need to deliberate on further and or um, bring in some experts to help us out. Okay, uh, Janet. I can do is I can circulate. I've been talking to different people and I don't know all their perspectives and um, but I can send you like little bios of these people. Like there's a couple of farmers. Um, there's, you know, there's some people at UMass who are studying forests. Um, and kind of like a matrix of like what's the most important you know how do you evaluate what to save and what not to save like people are looking at that um it's um and so i could just you know because it's not you know something we're going to decide on i can send that around to people because i don't want to i'm talking to people saying i think you have a lot to bring to the group people are willing to come um they are in the trenches of everything and so i could say i'll circulate that in a memo to you because i don't want to keep waiting you know, and all of a sudden we're in May, we're like, well, what do we do with farms? And we haven't talked to a farmer. I mean, it seems, and I'm not, I'm not presenting like a point of view, but I think a group of people, like two or three people on each topic is going to have a really lively meeting. And um, that's it. All right. I just want to be um, uh, established that there would be a value added compared to um, what we can learn from with more questioning from Dave, who's kind of looking at it from a, um, a town perspective with some deep knowledge on farms and forests in, in, in Amherst, um, but not but speaking more at the uh, at, at sort of a town level as opposed to um, picking out two or three specific um, um, citizens or, or or farmers or forest owners. Um, but let's 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 work on this um but again let's let's focus uh meeting next time um on the bylaw um and um and, and um through that process uh, um, work on specific areas of, and questions that we want um uh some uh perspectives or experts uh to help us um help us get through Okay, uh, Jack. Last comment. I, I would I would say that you know Janet, maybe you uh, invite these uh, folks that you have conversations with to join the uh, group and and offer a public comment at the end of our meetings uh, if they are so interested. Uh, do you want, should I respond to that or? I yeah, or they could could um, you know if they if they want to share their perspective just through a written um, testimony or something to us. I would be embarrassed to ask Jonathan Thompson to watch a meeting and give a three minutes. He's this is his whole life has been dedicated to the forest like that we're you know connected to. So I I don't know. I I to me it's just this is I don't I don't understand how we would wouldn't want information from people who are active in the areas that we're going to regulate. It's it's you know I don't know maybe maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree literally but I would be I would be amazed if we hadn't 
brought in farmers to talk about their needs and their experiences. Go ahead, Martha. Yeah, well, uh, one suggestion then um, that I might make to follow that up, we could maybe even prepare, I don't know, three or so questions for farmers and then for one of our meetings, plan like a 15 or 20 minute public comment period or something and invite farmers to come and give their views on those questions. We might, you know, then at least get some variety of responses that might help if we prepare questions with things we wanted to know, but mm -hmm. it's just a let thought. Me, let me ask Stephanie, is there some precedent for doing something along those lines? Um, I not, I, I think that would be fine. I'm not sure I'd have to look into it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Janet, give you one more. One more. <laughs> Actually, this reminds me that one of the farmers I talked to last night who has like a small five acre farm and has worked in on a farm in Amherst for five years, he has a presentation of like a, a show of like things he thinks that um, for solar, like things you can do site solar on farms and regulate it, like what would be good? You know, he's, he has a whole presentation on that. So, which I don't know what it is, but I was like, well, you sound perfect for our group. <laughs> But okay, um, all right. Let's um, pick spend a little bit of time picking this up next time as well. But I don't think I, um, we want to um, activate anything quite at the moment um, on this without further discussion. Um, okay, uh, so with that, we're well over time, uh, and let me thank everybody um, for their um, work today. Um, uh, Chris, for your work getting uh, getting getting prepared, uh, Stephanie for leading us through this, um, and um, uh, we will meet next time on the thirty first. Um, and um, I just always like to give a heads up. Uh, it'll be Laura. Uh, you're the note taker next time. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Dwayne, I'm going to ask if you could give me a quick phone call at the end of this meeting. I just need to check in with you about something. Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, do I have your phone number? I guess so. It's um, on my okay. email. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll do. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye.